The bolt tongue is a multicolored, liquiverous, predatory bipedalian from the tundra around Glacier Cap North on Darwin IV, closely related to the arrow tongue, rayback and prairie ram. It is easily distinguished from its cousins by the white coloration on its back and on the top of its head. The gel sucker is a ravenous, almost mantis-like quadruped alien. Lumbering pairs can be seen stumbling into patches of jelly bladder plants. With greedy abandon, the awkward creatures rip into the wobbly bags of vegetable gel and drink their fill through their hyperextended proboscises. It is not long before the first bladders are shriveled husks. Their liquid drained or spilled. The glutted gel suckers then move methodically from one bladder to the next, ripping them apart, apparently for sport. Gel tumbles and cascades out in big chunks, melting into lumpy puddles on the ground. As each jelly bladder is destroyed, dozens of small, pinging hopper cones appear from their tunnel nests to snatch pieces of semi-solid bladder skin. The flipstick is a gigantic, tall, extraordinary, tubular-shaped, agile, stick-like monopodalian. Standing at an impressive height of 60 meters, flipsticks are very odd tubular animals swaying and bending slightly in the gentle breeze. Their globe-tipped balance organs are easily the most developed gyroscopic mechanoreceptors ever seen. At times, the great beast's fleshy feet will begin to wrinkle and compress, and there is a rushing of air from a great, deep inhalation. Without warning, the cylindrical animals will then launch themselves into the sky. Backlit by Darwin IV's twin suns, their darkened sides flicker with rainbow biolites, as they perform complete somersaults and land upright. The overdeveloped balance organs give it an incredible display of coordination. No sooner do flipsticks land than they are airborne again. Standing 60 meters tall, flipsticks can throw themselves as high as three times their own height into the air. The object of flipstick activity soon becomes visible as a cloud of small micro flyers is seen trying to elude the tubiform predators. The speed of this chase is remarkable, due to the distances covered W. I-T-H each bound after some incredible maneuvering a flipstick will plunge straight through the swarm of flyers it unfurls two giant umbrella-like scoops which have been previously folded flattened simultaneously emits an oscillating sonar jamming tone the tone creates enormous confusion amidst the swarm so that they fall easy victim to the vacuuming scoops of the air sifter in seconds three quarters of a micro flyer swarm will been sucked into the great animal while the rest disperses in chaos closer inspection reveals that their bodies are of very light construction with a latticework of muscles apparently lying in thin layers over the surface. The Arctic sedge slider is a large as low-moving herbivorous bipedalian from the tundra around Glacier Cap North traveling in small group sedge sliders enormous pink biolites shine like lanterns in the gloom of a receding storm at first they appear headless but as the sky grows lighter small dark beaks appear from beneath their anterior flaps these gradually extend until an entire head is visible the newly emerged black heads steam for a few moments in the frigid air until they cool off the these large creatures have evolved a unique means of keeping their bare heads protected during arctic storms be retracting them deep into their insulated body cavities sedge sliders are anything but quick pulling their 10 meter tall bodies across the crunchy ground with laborious strokes of their huge hooked feet they they are among the noisiest animals found on Darwin IV slamming out their pings with deafening regularity. The sedge sliders are placid animals digging peacefully in the frozen Arctic soil for the subterranean snowbulbs that comprise their diatas. As they move along there is the impression when looking at the ground behind them that some indecisive paleontologist has been at work digging here and there and leaving shallow holes all about because because of the proximity of the glacier the sedge slider has developed the ability to ricochet sonar signals off the ice wall, in fact this seems to be its preferred means of echolocation while a group of sedge sliders feed some of them is always stationed near the glacier wall bouncing its pings off into the tundra while the other individuals remain silent. Greater than sonar analysis indicates that these are not single but multiple pings that reach into a number of directions simultaneously. The complexity of the retuned signal must be considerable explaining the huge sonar bulge atop the creature's bodies. Nature, as opportunistic as ever, has taken full advantage of the glacier and its acoustic capabilities. The thornback is an armored, 
Gregarious. Herbivorous Tripedalian, there can be at least two major herds feeding alongside each other, each composed of about 100 individuals pinging and eating. As many as five pods of thornbacks will break away from the main herds. They meander around the dusty ravines, searching for round, rolling, succulent fodderball weeds that make up their usual forage. Predators that will hunt down these wandering individuals include arrow tongues. When thornbacks are in danger, they will make warning pings. When running, thornbacks' clattering hooves seem to barely touch the ground. Their dorsal nostrils pucker and flare as their foamy breath moistens their armored backs. Members of a pod will run as one, instinctively knowing that security lays on their joined efforts. Running in a mass with only their horned backs exposed, they provide their pursuer with a confusing sonar image. Without a single target to focus upon, the hunter can only follow its prey and hope for a killing opportunity. The prairie ram is a common, liquivorous, predatory bipedalian from the planet. The powerful, liquivorous prairie ram is one of the more ubiquitous predators of Planitia borealis. Death of the prairie ram's victims is always by thoracic impalement, a method which affords the hungry killer quick ingress for feeding. These creatures are so strong that many have been observed, heads embedded in gory viscera, carrying their impaled prey across the plains for kilometers. A strange sidebar of the prairie ram's killing technique is the eloquent pair of skeletons it will leave behind. The Pratidas cephalon will still be buried in the ribcage of its prey, locked in between the ribs and vertebrae of an internal puzzle that it cannot solve and will ponder for eternity. The pronghead is a swift-footed, predatory bipedalian, from the plains of Planitia Boar. Alleys. The predatory pronghead is an archetypal Darwinian bipedalian. Heavily muscled and very agile, it is capable of running down large game, either on its own or in hunting pods. The rayback is a common, predatory, plains-dwelling, liquivorous bipedalian from Darwin IV. They usually hunt solitarily, but sometimes they will use cooperative hunting to take down certain prey. It is a smaller relative of the arrow tongue, though the rayback occupies a slightly different feeding niche upon the open plains of Darwin IV. It is known to weigh 13 odd tons. Supposedly, it may also be one of the few creatures on Darwin IV to have two sexes rather than be hermaphroditic, but this is unconfirmed. It is a leathery-skinned biped with four elongated spines protruding from its broad back, when resting, it squats close to the ground. Like all Darwin IV creatures, it does not have any eyes on its triangular head. Instead, it navigates with a barrage of high-pitched sonar pings when needed. When a rayback quickens its pace to a fast trot, leaping over broad ravines and pushing through the thick grass with ease, it can bring its speed up to a formidable 45 km per hour and can cover the terrain of the plains with great leaps. In pursuit of prey, a rayback can cover almost 5 km with both animals careening in wide turns and bounding over rocks and depressions. Even though a rayback can be clocked at 48 km per hour, certain difficult prey as gyrosprinters can race at nearly twice that speed. If a chase begins at closer range that outcome might be different, but, sometimes, a rayback's chases after prey can turn out unsuccessful. With heaving sides it will break off the hunt and trot to a halt, then it kneels down and rests in its squatted position. However, it does not always give up. It will often keep searching for prey, walking along and pinging occasionally while on a searching hunt. A rayback will end its chase for prey using its short, knife-like proboscis to slice a huge, crippling wound into the side of its prey. The prey animal, now trailing its entrails, will collapse in a cloud of dust. The triumphant R. Aback trots up to it and hunkers down to feed. This is accomplished by the liquivore inserting its tongue deep within its victim. Persistence can pay off for a hungry rayback. Faster and more agile than an arrow tongue, the rayback can outsprint the arrow tongue and, as a result, can tackle prey such as low feeding flyers, young herd animals, or ambushed gyrosprinters. Notable for its particularly unpleasant temper, raybacks will charge virtually anything that gets too near. The skewer is a large, sleek, fierce, predatory, Jet-like flyer with superb flying abilities, traveling upon the planet's strong air currents. 
It is widespread across much of the planet and is feared by many other animals. It is able to veer and bank while flying. These flyers usually hunt in mated pairs or, less frequently, in small, flying pods and use ultra-high frequency pings that can become more rapid when they approach their targeted goal of prey. They are thick-bodied creatures, powerfully winged and equipped with long, curved nasal lances that protrude from their heads. They exude an aura of frightening potency. During hunts, skewers can be followed by smaller scavenging flyers like violet follow wings. When herds of flightless prey, such as cymets, are startled by attacking skewers, they will attempt to jam the hunter's sonar with trilling. Normally skewers are undaunted by this. When attacking, they contract their corrugated, leathery wings and begin an awesome power dive. They often target any herd stragglers. Though when skewers plunge toward cymets, the herbivores will attempt to confuse the attacking flyers with their identically shaped heads and tails. To a creature relying on sonar recognition, they present a confusing image. The direction of their imminent flight becomes completely conjectural. At the moment of attack there is an all-too-clear transmission of the kill. Prey like cymets can sometimes leap clear, its would-be killer veering off to regain altitude for a second pass. At other times, prey is not so fortunate, taking the full impact of the skewer's wicked lance below its kicking feet, driving it down, and the lance's length, while the skewer pulls sharply up, away from the ground. The following scavengers, namely follow wings, get in a frenzy, darting forward to nip at the impaled victim. Bits of flesh fall from the prey animal to be caught by other scavenger flyers. The soaring skewer takes absolutely no notice of the scavengers, absorbed as it will be in sucking the carcass dry. A few minutes later, the scavengers are presented with a fluidless husk as the skewer lets it fall. They can be almost playful in their methods of dispatching prey, tossing their victims in midair from one to another until it is completely drained of fluids. One can find the shriveled husks of skewer victims virtually everywhere upon Darwin's surface. The large head is a very sturdy yet light construction, with bony structures buttressing the formidable lance. The lance itself is a marvel of design, being hollow, internally braced and as strong as titanium. It is also believed that it is, like the best blades, quite flexible. At times skewers hone their lances in numerous passes on volcanic wetting spires, upon examination of the inside of the lance, there is a battery of pointed, chitin-tipped tongues, each one capable of boring into flesh. This is how the skewer feeds on the wing. Upon the impalement of prey, these tongues will snake out of a dorsal groove on the lance and penetrate the body to suck it dry. Here is a classy irony of nature, a massive, powerful animal whose existence depends upon a fragile anatomical structure. The ice crawler is an ice dwelling, almost woodlouse like quadruped alien. It can leave behind many drag marks crisscrossed on areas of the glacier not unlike those of the foothill dwelling keeled sliders. The scale of the tracks and the forelimb strokes are dissimilar, however, and the two species are as well. There will also be innumerable small tunnel openings in the ice cliffs. They occur in clusters, but there seems to be no obvious pattern to their distribution. Each individual ice crawler, while found motionless in their winter hibernation, is embedded in a translucent sac which, in turn, can be frozen to the glacier's surface. These sac s are roughly 3 meters long, smooth, rigid, and ovoid. They appear to have been in place for some time. Though the sacs are somewhat translucent, it is difficult to discern the shapes of the core creatures within. Something can sometimes be seen to stir, but scanners of the expedition have given back only the weakest of signals. Most of the scanner beams bouncing off of the strange, impermeable sacs. Weeks pass and by early Arctic spring most ice crawlers in a group will be gone, leaving only a small number of individuals behind in the same spot. All but one or two of these left behind individuals will be free of their sacks and their transformation is remarkable. The ice crawlers fully revealed are almost as enigmatic as they had been in their sacks. No legs or feet or even head are visible, each animal is covered with tightly joined yet flexible armor plates. With no features to show it is hard to even distinguish head from tail. As the creatures finish eating their own sacks, they begin to move over the ice with surprising speed, each one leaving an unnaturally slick trail behind. Only their movement gives any clue as to which end is the front. As they move off, there are many straight trails etched into the ice, corresponding, it is assumed, to the many absent ice crawlers of the group. After feeding, 
They are always on the move, leaving the glacier sculpted by their scalloped feeding tracks and locomotion marks, and littered with their fecal coils. The Rhyme Runner is an elusive, small, dark colored, fast moving, ice dwelling monopodalian. When in motion, it creates a blurred impression of a dark animal speeding over the ice. It is a rare sight to see this creature as it dashes across the glacier. The Rhyme Runner is, like most of Darwin IV's monopt aliens, a ricochet saltator, equipped with one powerful leg attached to a complex pelvis. This small species, unlike its ground dwelling cousins, is not particularly fast, a fact to do with the problems inherent in traveling over ice. Its dark, dorsal markings give it a hooded and somewhat threatening appearance. As it lifts its broad, three toed foot, it shows one adaptation that increases traction upon the ice. The padded sole of its foot is deeply channeled and grooved, and with each footfall the pad expands and grips the ice. Each fold probably possesses some additional microstructure to further enhance traction. The most singular aspect of the Rhyme Runner is the nearly independent sensory packet that precedes the animal as it moves about. There is also a parachute-shaped structure, it looks like some unfortunate prey that is in imminent danger of being caught by the Rhyme Runner. Indeed. The monopodalian halts only after its face has split vertically and the victim has been sucked within. The assumption that the beast has fed cannot be further from the truth. Presently the animal ejects its prey and begins to run again. The domed, orange structure is attached to the rhyme runner by the thinnest of neural cables. There are numerous siphon holes on the flattened rear of the structure, each puffing continuously to keep it ahead of the trailing body. It is a marvel of physiological engineering and, even now, its function is not entirely certain. The Rhyme Runner's sonar clearly emanates from its body, and it is imagined that most of its other senses do as well. Looking closely at the structure of the floating organ, there is a tiny, iris-like opening at the front of the organ, and it is reasoned that perhaps it is a primitive light-gathering structure. Whether it is evolving or degenerating, whether it is a radical advance in Darwinian senses or an antiquated vestige that is in the process of being disca. R-D-E-D. There is no way of knowing. It must be vestigial. The mummy nest is a bizarre, pinkish-red, tundra dwelling. They have a peculiar relationship with the mummy nest flyer. From a distance of a few hundred meters, it is hard to make out what this object is. It is hard to tell from a distance if it is an animal or some inorganic formation. A much closer view reveals that it is topped by a dim yellow biolite, which means that the object is organic and alive, or has once been. It is now a withered, flattened husk that more resembles some sun-dried vegetable than an animal. But in this case it is the merciless arctic wind, not the sun's, that has brought the creature to its desiccated state. Strange surface features become more apparent upon closer inspection, serpentine tubes twist over and through furrowed folds which circle sphincter-like holes. Its bizarrely baroque texture sheds little light on the creature's original appearance. Larger features such as a dorsal whip-like appendage and a frontally situated leg-like limb, are equally mysterious. This 3.5-meter tall mummy has something strange in its head, there is a dark opening just beneath the dimly glowing biolite. The emptiness in the hole seems to confirm that this is nothing more than a mummified carcass. But why is the biolite still glowing? The answer is very strange. A mummy nest flyer will often appear and circle the mummy nest. Within a minute or so. The black flyer swoops down, with blurred wings it hovers, then lands upon the mummy's head and disappears into the hole. The flyer then never seems to reappear. So convincing is the carcass's moribund appearance. In spite of the biolite, the frozen husk appears as wind desiccated as any dead creature on the tundra. It turns out that this cryptobiotic mummy nest is providing warmth and shelter to the little flyer. There is big debate on the relationship between the nest creature and the flyer. Difficult as this may seem, one small clue has been presented when the flyer enters the husk. As it backs into the head cavity its configuration seems to line up with the rim of the opening as if the two had once been joined. This leads to the speculation that the flyer and the husk were one and the same animal. Separate. D. At some point in the flyer's development, it is concluded that the husk remains alive through the flyer's tending and serves to protect it from the harsh climate. The mummy nest flyer is a small, black flyer that beats its wings in a similar rapid way to Earth's hummingbirds. The shrill pinging of this flyer can be heard as it heads rapidly towards something. It can compete, in an agitated manner, with its own kind and other species for the things it needs, food and shelter. 
With blurred wings it can hover. It will seek out mummy nests. And once it finds one it will circle around it, land upon the mummy's head and disappears into the hole. After this, it does not seem to ever reappear. There is one small clue to the reason out of the relationship between the nest creature and the flyer. When the mummy nest flyer enters the husk, as it backs into the head cavity its configuration seems to line up with the rim of the opening as if the two had once been joined. This leads to the speculation that the flyer and the husk were one and the same animal, separated at some point in the flyer's development. It is concluded that the husk remains alive through the flyer's tending and serves to protect it from the harsh climate. There is no proof to support the theory of the two once being one creature, and as only one individual mummy nest was encountered during the first Darwinian expedition, the answer remains a mystery. The belly thrower is a fierce, predatory monopodalian. It lives in Planitia borealis. It is a ricochet saltator. Darwin IV's monopt aliens are mostly air sifters. An exception is the belly thrower. A fierce predator that ejects its stomach from its oral sphincter and throws it over its prey like a net, then pulls it in slowly, digesting its unfortunate victim even as it struggles to get free. The unth is a migratory, gregarious, tusked, tundra-dwelling, herbivorous bipedalian from the tundra around Glacier Cap North. The unths, so named for the loud sighing sound that accompanies each heavy footfall, will migrate in herds to their calving grounds to the north in the spring. Herds can number about 200 individuals, and their nervous energy, why is almost palpable. Most of the individuals during spring migrations are of breeding age and many display the distended bellies of pregnancy. Some winters can be hard, the number of young reduced and all the herd members appearing underweight. Even so, they can be an impressive sight treading through the sedge. These creatures rut in the fall. The bulky, Six meter tall unts, tails and backs filled out with their summer's stored fat reserves, cluster in pre courtship groups. Because there is only one sex among them, the only members of a herd exempt from the ritualistic displays are the very young, the sick, and the aged. The remainder of the individuals are jabbing their tusks into the snow and earth or stamping about trumpeting. This bulging, which emanates from the eight openings on their flanks, is a deep, beautifully four toned peel, rich with pained desire. It is easily heard for miles around. Two large unts can engage in the preliminary bio-light flaring of ritual combat. Standing in place, they rotate rapidly, throwing up clods of snow and earth and pinging loudly. Abruptly, they will stop and face each other, tossing their heads and scratching the ground with their tusks. Sometimes mild pushing matches and tusk clashing contests will ensue. Moments later, they will begin rotating again with renewed energy. The sounds of their combat echoes in the frozen air. Eventually, after a number of weeks, the unts will reach their spring destination, a plain just a few kilometers from the glacier's wall. There appears to be no difference between this part of the tundra and any other, yet the weary unts seem relieved and content. Ever vigilant against arctic bolt tongues, skewers and other predators, they proceed to scoop out large cavities in the ground that will receive their young. Into these cavities the unts regurgitate large quantities of snowbulb pulp acquired from a nearby field. The pulp will solidify and provide an edible, cushiony nest lining for the active infant unts. Soon the air is filled with the sounds of birthing. For days pings, groans, and sighs bounce early off of the nearby glacier and carry for miles into the open tundra. The breeding ground becomes a noisy nursery for scores of tiny, tuskless unts. Dutiful parents go in shifts to gather food for the demanding infants. The activity and noise are ceaseless, and through it all it is behavior that has not changed for hundreds of centuries. The tundra plow is a bizarre, black-colored, herbivorous bipedalian from the tundra around Glacier Cap North with a strange method of feeding. These creatures can be seen in groups of half a dozen slowly dragging themselves along the near-frozen ground. They leave behind long grooves that etch the tundra's surface for hundreds of yards. With these furrows, this is how the tundra plows got their name. Two heavily muscled arms terminated by flippers pull the three-meter-long body with deliberate strokes, leaving both the furrow and small piles of dirt in its wake. Every stroke brings forth from the creature's nostrils a tall plume of vapor that freezes on contact with the frigid air and rains down as snow upon its back. It's heavy. Black tegument glistens with this moisture as it heaves its laborious way along. 
It seems a creature uncomfortable with its own method of movement, yet its very survival in the harsh tundra environment proves this notion wrong. They travel very slowly. On occasion an individual will approach a clump of arctic cactus or polar does, and these will disappear from sight as if plucked from below. 10 meters apart and parallel to one another, the beasts travel only about 40 meters during an hour of feeding, squealing and belching vapor and turning the soil like harrows. A significant portion of the tundra plow's body remains unseen while the animal is alive. A large bony plow, triangular in shape, travels just below the surface, cutting and pushing the soil into six waiting mouth grooves for moisture infiltration. Extending from an opening in the bottom of the plow is a hollow, rigid tongue, terminated by a vertically hinged ovoid structure. This extensible mouth pod is unquestionably the organ responsible for plucking the small arctic plants from below, 